No, um, we're not going to have um, the verses up on the, the screen behind me this morning. Uh, we're going to do something a little different this morning. Uh, take a break from Hebrews this week and um, look at a passage that's been uh, sort of dear to my heart uh, because it reveals so much. Uh, we're going to talk about, you know, on the bulletin, on, on the front of your bulletin and on our website and all that, the tagline. Uh, and, and I say that kind of loosely because it's an advertising term and we're not here to advertise, but we are here to promote Jesus. Um, it says, learning to think like Jesus. And, and I started praying about, Lord, you, you want me to do something special on our first Sunday in our new building? And I just sensed a nudge to, uh, to talk about what does that mean? Um, one of the things that I resist is pithy little statements about Jesus about the church. And what I mean by that is uh, it seems like every church has a, has a, a pithy statement. And, and you know, some come to mind, I'm not going to even go there. Uh, there are some that really bug me because they only reach about halfway there. And, and, and they leave people kind of with a wrong impression. And yet, I love the fact that part of why we're here, what we do who we are as a church is that we come together. Uh, this is the huddle. Sunday morning, Sunday night. The rest of the week is when we're running the plays, to use a, a football analogy, which you may or may not connect with. But the point is, is that, that this is why we come together. We want to learn to think like the Lord. We want to learn to understand what his will is. We want to understand from his word, by his spirit, what it is he wants of us. And, and, and a great deal of that is as he transforms us, he renews our minds. And as he renews our minds, then our actions follow. Does that make sense? I'm going to talk about, I want to look in Luke chapter 15 this morning. Again, we're not going to have the scriptures up on the, the screen. I just want to uh, go through a passage here. And I want to look at and sort of segue into uh, a day in the life of Jesus' ministry. What's going on here in Luke chapter 15 is he's travel Jesus is traveling. He's been in the northern region of uh, the country. He's been up in the Galilee region, and he's traveling down to Jerusalem. It's towards the end of his ministry. It's his last trip to Jerusalem. He has gone a couple of times before and observed the Passover, partaken of the Passover lamb and all of that, all that that represents. This time when he goes to Jerusalem, he is the Passover lamb. He is the lamb of God that will take away the sins of the world. And so as he's going along in Luke chapter 13, it says that, in, that he's traveling through the cities and the villages teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. So as he's going along, uh, he's teaching the people, and huge crowds are gathering. They're following him. He's drawing people. He, this guy teaches with an authority that had been unknown to them by any uh, uh, of the, the rabbis of the day. Uh, I, I think about when Jesus would be teaching in the temple precincts, there, there were uh, colonnades, rows of columns up on the top of the temple mount, and the rabbis would go into these areas and teach, and that when they would, I think little crowd, little crowd, little crowd, Jesus, huge crowd, little crowd, little crowd. That's how it would be because he just had something about him. We know that that was because he was anointed with the Holy Spirit that when he spoke, he spoke with authority and he spoke the mind of God. And so as he's communicating these things to the people here, why did he stop and teach so often? Why did he teach in parables? We're going to look at that as we go through this passage this morning. Very important things that we can pull out. Uh, and in chapter 14, we see that he's eating with a ruler. Uh, he, he got invited by the Pharisees to eat, at, to have a meal at a ruler of the Pharisees' home. And he rankles these guys while he's there because he heals a guy on the Sabbath. And they are scandalized because they didn't have any concept of what it was to think like God does. They thought they had God figured out, but they had so distilled the things of God down to lists of rules and lists of obedience and lists 
that they had to follow. And when they followed him, then they're doing good. And when they didn't follow him, they're not doing so good. And, and it was this whole thing that they had laid out. And Jesus came against that because he came to reveal God to man. And in doing so, to literally teach man to think like him. And so I want to look at this parable in, uh, in Luke chapter uh, 15. It's the parable of the lost things. And first, though, what is a parable? The Greek word means to lay down alongside of it. It's like what Jesus would say. He'd say, you know, the kingdom of God's kind of like a farmer. And, and then he would tell a story, and it means to lay down alongside of it. He would lay down a, a, a story that we could connect with alongside of a spiritual truth or a spiritual reality. And so as he's teaching these parables, he's literally teaching people to stop thinking like the world and start thinking like a redeemed person, which they would be shortly, and they would be imbued with the Holy Spirit and all of that. So as he's teaching these things, he's bringing in this radical teaching of the kingdom. And the point of that teaching was to get people to understand that there's a different way to look at life. There's a different way to look at God. There's a different way to look at what's going on in your life with the things that you're going through. And so, uh, and this is known as the parable uh, of the, the prodigal son, the last part. There's three parables in Luke chapter 15. It's one parable, but three parables. Let me explain. It's the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost son, okay? It's the parable of the lost things if you look at the whole thing as a composite. Breaking it down, there are three different stories that he tells. Each one is to illustrate something about God, something about man, and something about God's will for how he wants man to look at things. And so when we go through here, we're going to start, uh, again, I just want to understand the parables, there's something interesting about them. In Luke chapter 8, Jesus tells them, he, he gives the parable of the sower. Remember that? It's actually, I call it the parable of the soils because he reveals four different soil types, four different conditions of the human heart. And the guy, he gives this whole thing, the farmer went out and he, and he uh, sowed the seeds, you know, on the rocky ground and on the path and, you know, on the fertile ground, all that. And the guys start scratching their heads. And, and, they, and they come up to him afterwards and they say, what do you mean? We don't understand. And he says, let me explain it to you. And he literally unpacks the parable and gives some great information there. He says, to you, it's been given to know and understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to the rest, it's in parables. To the rest, they're not going to get it. In other words, parables will reveal truth to some and they will actually conceal truth to others. And it all has to do with whether you have come to him by faith. If you have come to God by faith. That's why the things of God are foolishness. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, to the natural man. They don't make sense. It's foolishness. They, so what? Uh, I, I've shared uh, before about when my wife and I were on a little boat on the Sea of Galilee. We're right off of the city of Tiberias. And we're looking and I see all these big condominium type buildings up on top of this hill. And the guy's teaching us how to cast first century fishing nets, which I wasn't all that interested in. But uh, so I'm kind of daydreaming. I look at the top of this hill and I nudged her and I said, check it out. And she said, what? And I, I said, look, you, you can't hide that. And she knew that one of my favorite um, examples for parables is when Jesus said, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. It wasn't talking about a city on a hill. To those who had come to faith... They'd go, ooh, wow, that's deep. He's talking about my faith. He's talking about a, rea a spiritual reality. But the people that hadn't come to faith, in other words, he reveals truth to them, but to like the religious leaders standing around who were always mocking him and always trying to you know, get under his skin, and they didn't do a real good job of that because he usually had an answer for them. But, but to them, they'd look at the city on, and say, of course you can't hide a city. On, if, you know, that's a no-brainer. It's up on a hill. How can you? And so do you see how they fly right past the spiritual truth? And so when Jesus is teaching in parables, that's what he's doing. He's revealing truth to those who believe. He's concealing truth from those who don't. And we'll see that in this story as well. So uh, these crowds are following. 
interesting. Jesus in, in chapter 14, he is strongly, strongly exhorting people uh, to discipleship and to commitment. He is essentially telling them, you need to leave everything and come and follow me. Does that mean that we go and abandon our homes and our job? No, that's not what he was getting at. What he was saying is you need to start thinking differently about the things of God. God has to be first in your life. And that when he's first, everything else will fall into place. He says that in another place, doesn't he? In, in the Gospel of Matthew, he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the rest, the other things will come. So it's just a matter of priority. It's a matter of order in our lives. It's a matter of putting him in his rightful place, which is first, which is preeminent. And instead of people being put off, it says in chapter 14, he's giving these, these strong exhortations. They're actually drawn to him. And the crowds are growing. Why? Because he's revealing truth to them. The last words of, John, of Luke chapter 14 uh, are telling. Something that Jesus said a lot, something I pray for for our church a lot. Uh, he says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. What does that mean? Uh, again, as he's telling these parables, he who has ears to hear, those who have chosen to let the weight of their lives, we've been talking about that in Hebrews, to let the weight of your life down on Jesus. If you are someone who has done that, then you have ears to hear. The Holy Spirit is there and he will illuminate the things of God to your life. So when he says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Those are the people he's addressing. Those are the people that he wants to reach. And yes, he wants to reach the the. the the masses. He wants to reach the people who have not yet come to faith, but that's the point. He wants to bring them to that place where they release their life to him and they allow him to come in to set up housekeeping in their hearts and then allow him to live through them in their dealings with others. So no chapter breaks between chapter 14 and chapter 15. So he's just said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And we go into this parable of the lost things uh, and, and I want you to notice something in here. Pay attention to the word joy and rejoicing. If you want to understand what it is to think like Jesus, that's central. It's not optional. Something that makes me kind of crazy is when I see people, they adopt this thought that to be a Christian is to kind of have this lackluster life. You know, to look at it as though now I just, no, he's never about that. That's not what God's will is. It's not about not enjoying life. It's about not enjoying sin. That's the difference. If, if you're caught up in an area of sin or life-dominating sin, secret sin, get rid of it. There will be no joy in rejoicing, I guarantee you, because joy is the fruit of the Spirit. And if you have broken fellowship with God, that's not gonna, it's not gonna manifest in your life. So it's not about not enjoying. He wants us to enjoy our lives. Look at, again, key on joy and rejoicing in this passage. Uh, they're, they're really, it's critical that we understand in their, in their context as we understand what it is to think, to learn to think like he does. Verse one in Luke chapter 15. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. Again, he's speaking in their hearing. In verse 2, and the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Talk about thinking that is not consistent with who God is and what his will is. These guys were sort of the champions. Uh, and, and, you know, I, and I see people sometimes do that. We get into, sometimes I see Christians get into this. Uh, I, I, you may have heard me say before, I call it the black hat, white hat syndrome. It's like, well, I'm a Christian. I've got a white hat. All those people out there in the world, they've all got black hats. And, and, and we can do that. We can start to kind of judge people in that way. And, and I want to encourage you, brother or sister, if that's something that you do, if it were not for the grace of God resting upon your life, we have all got black hats, don't we? And that's part of what he's doing in this story. These guys, they thought they had the white hats. Oh, man, he's receiving sinners. Look at that. He's hanging out with those sinners, those sinful people. 
and, 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 and he's eating with them, which is a form of intimacy in their culture. It's like, that's more than just saying hi to somebody that comes to your door. That's inviting them in. That's having social interaction. And, and that was just, they were scandalized by this guy. Every time they turned around, the leaders were scandalized by this rabbi from Galilee. They're saying, you know, he doesn't really know anything about God. He doesn't understand God. They're conversing among themselves and they're, and, and they're literally ostracizing him and assuming that he doesn't know a thing about the mind of God and thinking that they do. He's about to turn that inside out. Uh, verse three, so he spoke this parable to them saying, uh, and he goes into the parable of the lost sheep. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. There's that word. Again, joy and rejoicing. Verse six, and when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Now remember, it's so important, you guys, you understand the audience that Jesus is addressing. On one side, you have the religious leaders, and they've gathered, and they're, you know, kind of, they're literally, it tells us in, in chapter 16 that they were literally looking down their nose at him. That, that was their attitude. They were turning their noses up, looking down their, and, and so they're standing off to one side with their, you know, in all their priestly regalia and all that, we've been talking about that. In Hebrew, it's not going to go there. But, oh boy, I'm tempted. At any rate, so yeah, they're over on one side, and then you have all of these like people like these sinners. And I want to say this honestly, people like you and me. That, <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's, so he's got all these regular people over here, and then all of these religious creeps. All right, that's a biblical word. That's fair. It's not. <laughs> so I, I added a little bit. So he's got these religious guys over here, and he's, he's, you've got to realize, understand the audience he's addressing with these parables. So he's talking about this guy, he loses a sheep, and he loses one. He's got a hundred of them, he loses one. And he, man, he is after it, trying to track this thing down. He's revealing an aspect of how God thinks, of how God thinks wills to work what he is going to work with man. It's what he wants to do. He's revealing he's going to go after this one sinner, not these religious guys. And, and so by that point, they're probably starting to stroke their beard like, what is he getting at? Not sure. So uh, he, he says, rejoice with me. I found the one that was lost. And, I, and Jesus says to you, to, to the people, he says, I say to you, likewise, that there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just or upright persons who need no repentance. Implying, and again, I picture him just barreling into looking at these religious leaders and, 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 and speaking to them. And then over 99 of you guys is what's implied in this passage. Who You don't think you need repentance. That's your problem. Uh, that's truly, and, and, and again, when he talks about repentance, it's about a change of what? A change of mind. It's about you don't, you're not even willing to relax your rigid standard enough to where you can even entertain the fact that maybe there's a different way to think about this. Maybe there's a different way to look at this. <clears throat> Something that's interesting to note is lost sheep don't repent. Lost people do. He goes on in verse 8, he talks about the parable of the lost coin now. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep out the house, and search carefully until she finds it? Now, I want you to understand, this is a, a woman who lost a quarter. All right? What happened in that culture, it, when she loses a coin... Uh, in the first century, women would adorn their bridal outfit with a chain of seven coins that they would drape across their forehead, okay? So when he's talking about this, what the people were connecting with would be the same thing as a woman who loses the diamond out of her wedding ring uh, or she loses her ring, 
All right, it's, she's that frantic to find this thing. This is a very, very valuable, irreplaceable coin. Like I said, it's not, she didn't just lose a, you know, a denarius or whatever. She lost part of her bridal outfit, and that's part of her dowry that she'll pass on uh, should that it work out to her own daughter. That, so this is a really important thing. And so in verse 9 it says, And when she has found it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I've found the peace which I lost. Likewise, Jesus says, <laughs> I picture him, again, looking at these guys, these religious leaders, I say to you, there's joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And so, uh, again, lost coins don't repent. Lost people do. Uh, The people, the common people standing there listening to this, they're probably hanging on every word at this point. And then he goes into the main parable in this passage, which is just, uh, it's amazing, uh, the, the way that he unpacks this to the people. Now, he... He talks about the repentance thing. He adds the repentance thing in the first two of these three parables. But the third one, he doesn't talk about it because it's lived out. Now he's not talking about a coin. He's not talking about a sheep. He's talking about a man. And and we'll see that again. But the emphasis here is the joy that God has over one sinner who repents. The The joy that God has over that thing which was lost now being found. Verse 11, and then he said, a certain man had two sons. I want to give you, I want to, I want you to understand again, with the crowd that he's talking to here, I want to give you the roles of the people in this parable before I actually read it. It'll help you again to connect with it. The younger of the two sons, there's a younger son and an older son. The younger of the two sons is represented here with the crowd that he's addressing by the sinners and the tax collectors, all right? The older of the two sons is representative of the Pharisees and the scribes, the religious leaders that are standing there literally looking down their nose at him. And the father, the the man who had the sons, is representative of the heart and the mind of God in this story. So, Understand, a parable, he's laying down this truth alongside of a spiritual reality because he wants to get these people to start thinking about the things of God differently. That's why we're here. That's what we want to do, isn't it? I want to understand God's will for my life. I want to understand as he's revealed himself through his word, I want to know him better. I want to understand what he, what he says in this. How does it apply to my life? And, and folks, I guarantee you, he will do it. If we come to him with that kind of a heart, because there's two kinds of hearts that are represented here, one's hard, one is open. And if we come to him with that kind of heart, I guarantee you on the basis of God's word, he will fill you and he will give you that which you seek. So he says, in the younger of them, in verse 12, said to his father, Father, give me the portions of good that falls to me. Now, when he says, give me, He's saying, uh, Father, I want your provision, but I really don't want your presence here. This younger son that's represented, he's saying, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. You owe me, Dad. And the father divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. So he squanders his inheritance. He blows through it. And, and the, the word prodigal there means wasteful. He just wastes his life. And, and he's... I, I picture, you know, loading up the four by four and heading out. You know, young guy. And, and he goes out and he and will find that he, he wasted on, on reckless living with women, with partying, with all the stuff that goes with all of that. Uh, and, and the thing that gets to me is why does Jesus say the guy travels to a far country? Why would he do that? And, and folks, sin will drive you to a far country. Sin uh, causes us to want to remove ourselves from any accountability to others. And I would submit to you that in our lives, a far country could be no further than your computer. 
It could be no further than perhaps someone that you work with that's beginning to make you feel good. Uh, that maybe you think maybe understands you better than your spouse. And I know a lot of you guys are retired now. But the point is, is that a far country is something that happens on the inside. It's represented in this story, but he's talking about an attitude of the heart where this guy removes himself. Why would he, he didn't want to live recklessly in the hometown where his dad lived. You know, he's going to have Aunt Matilda over there. What are you doing? You know, all of that. He's not going to do that. He wants to get the heck out of there so that he can go do what he wants and he can live completely apart from his father. We see that a lot in our culture, don't we? We see that. uh, I see that and it breaks my heart when I see kids that grow up in the church. One of the things that's kind of a hot button with me is with teen ministry, and, and, and I, I love the fact that churches reach out to teens. And, and, and yet, why is it that the statistics are 85% of teens, when they go through youth group, when they go out and they start to live their lives, that, that they end up in a far country? And, and, and I'll submit to you, my response to that is when a kid grows up and they leave home. And I'm, I'm not making a blanket statement, so please don't talk to me afterwards. <laughs> but, but when kids grow up and they leave home, are they going to pattern their life after their youth pastor? No. They're going to probably pattern their life after their dad, after their mom. And so if mom and dad, you're not plugged in, you're feeding your kids to the wolves. And I'm telling you, I I say that in all sincerity. And and I know that character plays a part. There are some kids that's like, I can't beat the kid into submission. You you know what I mean? There's there's sometimes a a strong character manifests and and there's not a lot you can do. And yet, that doesn't mean that you compromise. My point is, is that youth ministry starts at home. And it should end at home. Because that kid is gonna model their life after you. And if you're not living it, then neither are they. It's a very serious charge, something I take really serious. I took seriously when my kids were growing up, and it was like, you know, they knew what I meant when I said, when they'd be scrapping about something, I said, hey, take it to high ground. And, and they knew that it's like, oop, dad's gonna discipline if I don't. Um, but that meant take whatever you're scrapping about into the spiritual realm. Because that's where the answers are. It's not going to happen by, fi- by trying to find answers in the temporal ro- realm. It's just not. And, and, and as they got accustomed to doing that, I was blessed because as my kids grew up and became adults, they stayed with Christ and established it. I remember very distinctly in both instances where they would gesture in a certain way that showed me that they no longer were sort of riding on my shirt tails, but they had established their own walk. That's free. I didn't have that in my notes. But it's just important that we understand. And guys, with teens, that if we have some kids that are coming through the body here. Come alongside. You know, uh, my wife loves spending times with, time with some of the, the, the kids here. And, and, and it's up to us to nurture and to pour into. It's not just mom and dad. I mean, it, there, there's, we as a community, we look out for one another and, and we want to pour into our kids. I'm not saying that we don't have responsibility as a church. I'm saying the primary responsibility rests with the parents. So this kid blows through his inheritance. He goes to a far country and, and he's totally outside of his father's purview. He has, his, he has no accountability to his father or anybody else. Verse 14, but when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. So he hasn't hit bottom yet, and I would submit to you that bottom is where you put it. I used to hear that, well, that person hasn't hit bottom yet. Well, you know, if you haven't hit bottom and you're struggling, today could be the day because bottom is where we place it. It's not some ethereal place out there. Usually what it is is I'm so sick and tired and fed up with dealing with the circumstances I'm in, I'm finally willing to yield to God. And that's the point Jesus is making. These sinners and, and, 
The people are, they're, they're hanging on this. The religious leaders are like, what on earth is he talking about? Because he's concealing truth from them with this parable. But it, we'll see that they start to get poked as he goes along. So he, he's really beginning to be in want. He's seeing that he's suffering because of his own choices. But he hasn't gotten there yet. It says, then he went and he joined himself in verse 15 to a citizen of that country and he sent him into the fields to, to feed swine. For a Jewish boy... This is not good. <laughs> you don't go feed pigs. It's not, you know, I mean, this is, this, he is getting low. For him to be able to do that, uh, and, and what this is, it's, it's completely, it's self-reliance. He's trying to rely on himself, and, and, and so what he does is he turns to the world. He doesn't, you know, wow, my life's a mess. And, and see, I know I'll go join myself to a citizen of this foreign country and I'll feed his pigs for him. There's the answer. Yeah, sure. I'm out of money. I need a job. And well, this guy has an opening. But, you know, and there's a passage in Hosea chapter 6 that I I, I have always appreciated. Uh, And and it's something, it reveals something about our father's heart. Uh, When Hosea was going through what he went through with the the mess in his life, and not going to go there, (laughs) again, tempted, um, but it says here in, in Hosea 6, 1, come and let us return to the Lord for he has torn, but he will heal us. He is stricken, but he will bind us up. There are times, folks, where God not only allows, but he engineers circumstances in our lives. It hurts. And, and, and you know, I will never be that stick in the mud that goes, well, you know, no, there's a place for compassion regardless of what's going on or what God's doing. I mean, I feel compassionate when I know you guys are going through it, but there are times where we come to understand that he is tearing because he wants to heal. He's allowing circumstances that hurt because he wants to bring something about in our lives. And you want to know what that is? Usually, Romans 8, 28, he causes all things to work together for good to those that love him or are called according to his purpose. 8, 29, what his purpose is. For whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. He's causing us to learn to be like Jesus, to learn to think like Jesus, to learn to not walk according to the course of this world. And as a Christian, if we try James warns about it. He says in James chapter one, he says, don't be, don't be conformed to this. Don't be double-minded because he says, don't let the double-minded man expect he's gonna receive anything from the Lord. But what does double-mindedness mean? It means I wanna think like the world and I wanna think redeemed. It's oil and water, folks. It doesn't mix. You cannot effectively live your life trying to live it with one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. You're either all in or you're out. There's no fence. And so what he's putting forth here, this kid is getting to the point where he sees, he's beginning to see that his life isn't working. And he's beginning to identify and connect that with the fact that maybe he didn't have it so bad at dad's after all. Verse 15, he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate and no one gave him anything. When I was in Israel, I got out of the bus at one point. We had a little bus, a bunch of us guys were going up the highway in, and we got out to look out over the Sea of Galilee off this mountain. We were up in the Golan Heights, and, and I looked down, and there was this little bendy pod about that big, and it was brown, dark brown, and it, it felt real tarry and rubbery, kind of hard, and it was a carob pod. You guys have heard of carob. It's, they use it as a chocolate substitute and all that. Um, very common in Israel. In Southern California, they were brought in, and uh, we used to sling them at houses when I was a kid because it would make a noise and not break the window. But <laughs> anyway, I, I, I reached down and I picked my, I ended up putting it in my pack. I don't know what I did. It's probably still in some obscure place at home. But I went, wow, this is a carob pod. That's what's talked about here. Some people say, well, it was probably corn cobs and da, da, da. No, 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 they weren't growing corn in the first century. What Jesus is talking about, the pods that they fed the pigs with were these sticky, bendy, I cannot imagine trying to eat one of these things. It would have been horrible. So the pods that the, the pigs ate, the guy's getting so low, he's getting so hungry, he is so destitute now that he is going to start eating pig food. 
<laughs> and, and it says that, that no one gave him anything. And you know what? We live in the world of give me, don't we? Remember he started out, Dad, give me the goods. I want your provision, but not your presence. And now he's run out of money. What? Where's his friends? They're gone. I have heard that so many times as somebody coming out of the gr- drug culture. Oh, you know, God worked into my heart and I, uh, you know, I had a friend that said God loved me off of meth. And I, I said, praise God. And he said, you know what? And, and the minute I stopped, there was nobody, nobody around. Everybody bailed because they didn't want to look at their own stuff. And when you stop and you're caught up in an area of sin and, and other people aren't, I mean, he was literally ostracized from the whole drug counterculture and all that because he came to a point of getting right with the Lord. Well, it says no one gave him anything. No wonder because that's the give me culture. It's because that's what they're doing too. My worldly friends want my provision and not my presence. He's finding that they're treating him the same way that he treated his dad. Verse 17, but when he came to himself, or it, it literally came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I love this part. It says, when he came to himself. That's bottom. When he finally got to a point of saying, you know what? My father's hired servants they're not hungry like I am. Maybe it wasn't so bad at dad's. Maybe I was a little hasty. Maybe it was a lot hasty when I got the goods and ran. And now I'm out of money. I have no friends. They're all gone. I don't have any money anymore. I don't have anything that they want. And even my father's slaves, his hired servants, they have more than I do. What's wrong with this picture is essentially what he's saying. Remember, Jesus is talking to the, the, the religious leaders and the tax and, and the sinners and all that. And, and, and I can imagine the place being completely silent as he speaks this. So essentially, this guy came. It was the worst, best day of his life. God has his attention. And again, understanding the parable is laying down a spiritual truth. He's talking about somebody who is so sick of the sin in their life, so sick of not being accountable to anybody, especially not to God, so sick of trying to live it on their own by their own rules and to do their own thing that, that they come to the place of saying, you know what? Maybe God has a better idea for my life than I do. Maybe he wants to work something in me because even the lowest of the low in his house are better off than I am. That's great stuff. Verse 18, I'll arise and go to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Now, When he says a hired servant, what they did in that culture is they had house slaves and they were slaves that were indentured. You know, the doulos, the the, the ones that were staying there. If a guy needed help, you know, like what what they'll do on farms here, they'll hire migrant workers to come in and they'll work for a season and all that. Essentially, the hired servants were, they were temps. We would call them a temp in our culture. He's got more that needs to be done. And, and what happens when you hire a temp? I used to, when I was running my businesses, there were times where I would uh, consider bringing in a temp because I have more to do than I can get done, but I don't want to have any commitment to them. When it's done, I, I want them to go away because I don't want to pay them. <laughs> and so, um, so what he's saying is my father's hired servants, that's significant. He's saying even the guys that are temps that my father has no commitment to take care of beyond the immediate task, they're better off than I am. And, and, and so when he says, make me like one of your hired servant, uh, servants, I, I love this too, because he, he goes from the world of give me, give me the goods, dad, you owe me, to the world of make me a servant. 
That's thinking like Jesus. That's not thinking like the world. That's not thinking like the religious guys that are standing around. That's thinking like a sinner who's on his way to being a saint. Four signs of a penitent heart that we see in this is the first is to realize what's been lost. Uh, Guys, it's between our ears. Uh, Again, when I talk about learning to think like Jesus, this is central. Repentance is central in the life of any healthy Christian. And it should not be something that you did back in high school or whenever you came to the Lord. This is an ongoing process. This is something that, this is how we stay current. This is how we stay clean. This is how we stay fresh with the Lord. This is how we stay empowered by the Lord. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is that of empowering us. When I'm in sin, that stops. That doesn't mean I've broken relationship with him, but when I break fellowship with him, and there's a difference, I believe that my relationship with him is secure. But if I want to get into an area of sin, the Holy Spirit's ministry changes from that of empowering to that of coming around to head me off at the pass and say, John, stop it. You need to get right. Don't go down this road. It's going to yield disaster or it's going to yield on, you know, whatever bad fruit. And and so that's what he, that's what he's doing here. So to realize what's been lost, this guy realized he had lost every bit of the comfort and security and all that he had living under his father's roof. So the next thing is to recognize sin. Recognize sin for what it is. Sin. (laughs) It's, you know, and the world puts all kinds of crazy labels on sin to try to make it more palatable. No, it's sin. (laughs) Anything that is short of God's holy perfection, if you want the broadest definition, is sin. It misses the mark. It's short of what he is about, short of who he is. And so what this guy did, he realized what he'd lost. He recognized his sin. Even my father's servants are better off than I am. He remembered that it's about how, and, and the, 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 another aspect of repentance is to remember that it's about how God sees me. Not about how I see me because I can get under condemnation and I can start thinking, and it breaks my heart. I mentioned before, when people come to me and they say, well, I think God's mad at me because I have this circumstance or that in my life. No, God's working in your life. But if you know him, if you are his child, he's not mad at you. He may be working in your life. So to remember, it's not about what I think, it's about how he sees me. The guy says, I'm not worthy to be your son. And God In a sense, it's like he's saying, you're right, but I've made provision for that. His name is Jesus. He went to a cross. He died in your place. And so we remember it's not about my emotions. It's not about how I feel about it. It's about God's disposition in the thing. And the last is to respond in faith and humility. So we realize, we recognize, we remember, and we respond. Uh, Very important that repentance be full-blown in our lives. Don't go partway there. Uh, Sometimes, you know, I know in my own life, I've noticed, especially as a younger Christian, what I would do is I would feel badly long enough to where I thought I'd felt badly long enough that I must be now forgiven, which is kind of weird. Uh, because I was basing it on how I felt. And it's like, yeah, there's guilt, and there, there was shame or whatever it was. But no, if I have asked God to forgive me and, and I have been cleansed by him, I can hold my head up and I can move forward. Yeah, sometimes there's consequences to our actions and all that. I'm not saying that's not the case. But folks, it's a healthy thing to change your mind about something in your life and to start thinking like Jesus, to start understanding in a deeper way what he wants from you. I guarantee you, your life will be blessed and you'll be a blessing to others because we want him to work in us and through us. Verse 20, and he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and he kissed him. Uh, This is just such a great story. I mean, number one, old guys in the Bible don't run. (laughs) 
Um, and his father can't wait. You know, and, and something I think about is like, I've wondered about is like, and I remember having teenagers and going to the window and maybe hearing the car drive by and thinking, is that her? My daughter was always staying out later than she's supposed to. Um, but I remember just that, just that uh, inside, you know, my ki- I don't know where my kids are. And, and I, was, I, I can't read the story without thinking, I wonder how many times he went to that window. To see him a long ways off meant that God was looking for him. He wasn't waiting for his son to come up and show up and start tugging on his pant leg and saying, please forgive me, please. No, his father was looking for him. He sees him. He understands, this is my son coming home. He runs out. He tackles the kid. Another thing you didn't do in the first century. You don't run and you don't tackle people. And I want to encourage you guys, don't run, don't tackle. Seriously, though, he doesn't, I mean, this is a really significant thing. And when Jesus is telling this, I, can ima- I imagine the Pharisees, man, they're really starting to look down their nose at him like, what? You know, what is he talking about? The father goes and he tackles this kid. What? You know, and, and, and the people, the, the sinners and tax collectors brightening up and thinking, wow, maybe there's hope for me. And, and he's like, yeah, that's right. That's part of the purpose of this. I'm revealing truth to you. And, and, and this is just a great scene. Uh, and it says that he had compassion, fell on his neck, and he kissed him. And what's in, indicated in the Greek is that he repeatedly kissed him. Wong, 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 wong. I mean, he just won't let this kid go. He's smothering this guy with love. You know, something that, uh, that uh, this is part of my vision for us, for our church in, in this place, is um, I love that there's a great deal of love in this body. And that we love each other a lot. I love the fact that we have a healthy church. We're in a state of peace. We're not going through. And I hear stories, guys, from other pastors I know and all that. Churches that are going through it where somebody's tearing it up. And, or, or there's just all this discord and, you know, all of that. I praise God that he's given us a healthy church. And it's a safe place to come into worship. And I pray that when people come through that door that you love them the same way that you love each other. That's what will set us apart. We, and please, don't tackle them and kiss them repeatedly. That wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't go. But do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, to know us by the love, yeah, that we have for one another, but to know us by the love that we have for the stranger that walks in the door. To know us by the love and the embracing. Folks, I want to encourage you, look for new people coming in. Don't be so caught up in your, in, in your, in your sphere, in your, your own little world. I'm not going to, well, that's not right. But don't be so caught up in, in to be short-sighted and think, well, somebody else will do the greeting or somebody else will go love on them. No, come out of your shell. Come out of your comfort zone and embrace people that are new that come in. Show them the love of Christ. Uh, I can't get to everyone. When somebody, I look for people that are new that come in. I want them to know the kind of love that we have here. And we all know it. It's up to us as a body that they know it. Uh, Enough said on that. Verse 21, and the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And and he doesn't get the chance to finish his speech. Remember, he said, you know, make me like one of your high, all that. No, his father cuts in. Why? His father interrupts him because, and one of the things that's true, guys, is with repentance comes restoration. This guy is restored just by coming towards the house. I mean, He doesn't have to go through a ceremony. He's already restored because something's happened in his heart. And and just by the fact that his father comes, tackles him, kisses him, all that, and and what the father does next is significant because restoration has already taken place. Verse 22, he says, But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it. And let's eat and be merry. For this son of mine was dead 
and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So now we see that the workings of repentance are in place. He doesn't have to tell them as he's teaching these guys that are standing around about repentance. This is happening. We see the the fruit of the repentance. We see that this kid is restored to full fellowship with his father, to full status. why, Why does he do the ring, the robe, the calf, all of that? Because he is restoring his son to complete full status as a son. This is the fruit of repentance. It's the fruit of being current with dad. It's what we have in in our lives as we walk with the Lord. How do we stay current with him? It's right here. It's right here. And it's beautiful. Repentance should never be an ugly word for us. It should be a beautiful thing. I was at a pastor's conference a little over a month ago, I guess, whatever it was, um, and, and one morning, a, a, a pastor's wife stood up and just broke. And she was broken in repentance over some areas of pride in her life. And she just shared with the entire group. I mean, all the Calvary pastors in Oregon were there. And, and, and it's like, God bless her for the boldness to share her own brokenness but to know that the healing and the restoration had already taken place and what we're seeing is the fruit of her repentance. It's not the end here of the story. Uh, Unfortunately, this this kid, he was dead, he's, he's alive again, he was lost, he's found, and there's joy and rejoicing. We talked about that. He has to say it in the other two. Now it's being lived out in this particular parable. We see that, man, we're going to have a party. My son was dead, and he's alive. He was lost, and now he's found. Parable of the lost things, now we're talking about lost people. And that's the point that Jesus has been making in all of this parable, the, the, the overall parable of the lost things. He's talking about people. He's talking about people who have come to the end of themselves and see just maybe, perhaps, God has something better. And they're willing to acknowledge their sin and to turn and to embrace him. Verse 25, now his older son, who are the, who's the older son represented in this story? Yeah, the scribes, the Pharisees, the religious leaders. The older son was in the field. And as he came, he drew near the house, he heard music and dancing. Remember the Pharisees in their complaint? <laughs> so he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in and therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. Interesting to note, the older brother, he wasn't looking for his brother. He's outside now, he's pouting. Now, that's a real mature stance. He says, What's all of this? And his father goes out and and, and he pleads with him. And his father, it's as though his father's saying, don't you take my joy away in this. Don't do it. Come in, be a part of this. Jesus is beckoning to these religious leaders even though he knew that they had hardened their hearts against him. Even though he knew that every chance they got, they were looking down their nose at him and the things he was doing that as he is now teaching people what it is to be a part of the kingdom of God, as he is teaching them that it goes way beyond your rules and your regulations, he's inviting them, he's beckoning to them to come and to be a part of this thing called the kingdom of God because they had so missed it because they were hardened in their understanding, hardened in their thinking, hardened in their hearts. And they were missing what God had to say. So here's Jesus, God the Son. He's in commoner's clothing, sitting in front of the scribes and the Pharisees as they're saying, you don't know what God is like. What kind of a paradox is that? There's Jesus, you know, dirt in his hair, crumbs in his beard, teaching these profound things, and he's just got just a regular day, you know, commoner's tunic on, and these guys with all their regalia, robes and all that. Verse 29, so he answered, he said to his father, lo, these many years I've been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. You never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours, he doesn't say this brother of mine, as soon as this son of yours came, who's devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. 
In verse 29 there, as I was reading, it, it, it just can't escape me. How many times this younger son says, I and me? And, and, and again, he says, the son of yours. Verse 31, and he said to him, son, you're always with me and all that I have is yours. Interesting, he says, all that I have with yours is, is yours. He doesn't say, you have your half. God is not in the business of division. He's in the business of multiplication. And he says, all that I have is yours. And you know, all that he has is yours and yours and yours and yours. That's what it is to belong to him. Verse 32, it was right that we should make merry and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Interesting. The story ends there and I would imagine again as Jesus has been talking about, he's talking to these two groups of people that there was some real interesting things going on as he looked and he saw people that were connecting with what he was saying, as he saw people, he looked and he saw people that were, had no interest from the start in what he was saying. But it's a glorious thing. Again, why do we as a church have, why do we think, or learning to think like Jesus, why do we put that forward? It's because of things like this. I mean, this is just one passage in God's word where he wants to inform our thinking. He wants to get us to where we're not thinking about things in the old way because that flesh, that fallen nature, that nature of sin, that nature of rebellion, that nature that says, I can figure it out. I'm gonna do it my way. I'm gonna go where I'm gonna go. All of that stuff. He says, you know, you can have quiet in your soul as you embrace me, as you embrace my will, as you embrace my way of doing things, my way of thinking about it. And so often, I know in my life, I'm in process just like you. And so often in my life, I'll react to something that comes my way or something that's said rather than respond. And I'm learning as I go to take the time to stop and to consider, Lord, what will reflect you in this? And as I do that, and as he informs my thinking, as I stop the knee-jerk thing, and I just begin to more and more ask him to help me to grow in this, I see that there's greater peace in my life. I see that there's greater rest in my life. I see that there's more fruit of his spirit in my life because I'm making room for him to be expressed through me, one decision at a time one thought process at a time. It's not about rules and regulations. It's about a living relationship with a loving Lord that waits for us. He wants to hear from us. He wants us to bow the knee so that he can come and that he can be the one with whom we have to do. I love the fact that we've begun a new chapter in our church's life today and it's not about the building. Yeah, it's a great building, and it's in a great location that, that will give us some more presence in the community and all that. But I love the fact that he has called us to be one body. And, and yeah, there's other churches around and, and all, but he's called us to be this church. And that we're gonna stand on the word of God. As we go forward, we're gonna love people with the kind of love that the Father has here. Because it's, the father here, how does his love, how does that love that we look at in this parable, how does that get expressed in the church? It gets expressed through you, through me, as we deal with others. It's that kind of sacrificial, others-centered love that we're after, isn't it? That's how it happens. Close up with a couple of things. I know I'm running a little late, but... Um, uh, interesting, the father came out to both sons and each of us has a predisposition towards both prodigals. And I would submit to you that both sons were prodigal. They were, both sons were wasteful. One wasted his father's inheritance. One wasted the relationship. He, just, he didn't leave home, but his life was wasted. And... and, and and he was hard and unreachable, even though he was in close to his father the whole time. One son is drawn 
to his father. What's he drawn through? Love. The other's repulsed. He doesn't think that his father should be loving that creepy son that took off and did all the stuff. Second thing here is all, in all three parables, joy and rejoicing are intentionally amplified by Jesus. Why? First of all, it's because it's the heart and mind of God, as I mentioned. That's his heart. He is love and he is loving. He is gracious. He is compassionate. He is merciful. And he wants to build those attributes in us. That's what being conformed to his image looks like. The second thing that's noteworthy in this is because the religious leaders had none. There was no joy. There was just a rigid, self-righteous, pompous approach that could not have missed God more. They missed it. And Jesus, when he, he, when he got to Jerusalem and he got, came over the Mount of Olives, prophesied against them, weeping over the city. If you had known this day, the day of your visitation, but no, you, you guys killed the prophets. You, you, you've done away with those that, that I sent to you. And because of that, not one stone will be left in you upon another. And that happened. They totally missed it thinking that they understood God when they didn't. So our aim in learning to think like Jesus is not uh, found in thinking like the younger, squandering our father's inheritance, living like the world. We are to live lives that are set apart. That's what God says. And, and, and that's a process in our lives. We're all in process. And, and I've encouraged you guys many times before, don't, don't think you know God's will for the person sitting next to you. Understand his will for you. And, and you'll, you'll do well in that. It's not in thinking like the older, vainly puffed up. In Colossians, the Apostle Paul warns, he says, don't be vainly puffed up by your fleshly mind. And that's what those guys were doing. They were vainly puffed up. They were so vain, they were so puffed up, they couldn't grasp the things of God. Brian, yesterday at our men's breakfast, shared a passage from Philippians, and I had to smile inwardly. I didn't tell him about it. It was part of what I was going to share this morning. I went, oh, that's interesting. Um, but it's true, because uh, I love the way that the Holy Spirit orchest orchestrates those things and that uh, it, it tied together. And I'll close with this. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 7, when we talk about learning to think like Jesus, when we talk about understanding his mind, the, God, the mind of God, and yeah, he wants to reveal it. Paul says this, he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, or he emptied himself taking the form of a bondservant, going low and coming in the likeness of men. So he says, let this mind be in you. Have the mind of Christ. That's why we come together. That's why we study God's word. That's why we're not gonna get into a whole religious thing. I, I am so tired of religious trimmings. And, and I understand sometimes it's a contradiction. I don't mean that. Pure and undefiled religion, James says, is helping widows and orphans and all that. But I mean, religion in a negative sense to where we put forth a whole religious protocol and we ignore the heart of God, excuse me, being expressed in our lives. So uh, again, excited about what God's doing in our church, exciting that we have this place, a beautiful place to come and worship. And um, I'm excited for the rest of the afternoon. We've Got the potluck coming up uh, as soon as we're done praying here. And then um, after that, we'll uh, um, get together again tonight at 7 for teaching in Revelation. So uh, with that, let's pray. Guys, let's not do a last song this morning. We're running behind, and uh, we will uh, just break after this. So Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you've called each of us to be a part of this body. And, and Lord... Thank you for your love that, that you